Good morning and welcome to Memorial Baptist Church. We're thankful to worship with you today. If you are a guest uh, for the first time here at Memorial, there's a Connect card in the pew in front of you. Fill out as much information as you feel comfortable with on that Connect card and turn it in at the welcome desk. And we have a gift for you today for choosing to, to worship with us. One of the many ways that we worship at Memorial is through giving. There's multiple ways that you can give. You can give online, uh, in person, at any of our giving stations, online or on our church center app. And we thank you so much for your generosity and giving. And, and this is the first Sunday we will be doing the Lord's Supper today, and we will be taking a benevolent offering today. And that benevolent offering uh, is such a blessing to many people in our church and our community, so we'll be taking that offering today as well. Thank you so much for all that help, uh, all the people that helped with service in the park. It was a beautiful Sunday. We were away traveling, seeing, visiting some family, but uh, I think in six years of being at Memorial, we never were rained out so far at, at service in the park. So pray for it next year, right? Uh, but it's been beautiful. There are a few more events coming up at Memorial. We'll have another family movie night on October 25th. It's a Friday night at 6.30 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We're going to be watching Inside Out 2. So kids, uh, invite your family, invite your friends to come and see that. The second annual November Fest will be Saturday, November 9th, uh, 8.30 to 3 p.m. here at Memorial. It's an awesome uh, craft fair and table displays. Uh, there'll be all kinds of vendors making handmade items, uh, knitting and crochet items, macrame, wood crafts, soaps, candles. Uh, and if you know anybody that's a vendor and would like to set up for that, it's only $25 donation for a table. They can come and set up for November Fest to see Mary Beth Sprinkle. You may have seen the Christmas tree boxes that we have out in the foyer as well. Operation Christmas Child, uh, it's that time of year again here already, already, right? And we'll be packing boxes again for Operation Christmas Child. They are due back in about a month from now, right about a month from now. We have to have those packed boxes back by November 10th. Uh, the packing slips are out there if you'd like to take a box to pack and, and a packing slip of what goes inside those boxes Just pack one and return them back here to Memorial and we will get those distributed out Just a reminder that the armor of God class will be starting uh, October 20th uh, next week with Denny and George um, If you didn't get a flyer you can receive a flyer off of them uh, as well afterwards And uh, they're going to be meeting in the conference room uh, right in the back right through down this hallway through the glass doors in the back will be where that class is as well. And we uh, have an announcement then from uh, Elder Ron Sprinkle. going to wait about 15 minutes till everybody else gets in here. This is, <laughs> where, where are you? Where are you? Get in here. Uh, do you all know that we have a mailbox center uh, out in the hallway? Yes. Uh, if you do not yet have a mailbox, tell me, call the office, tell someone we want everybody to have a mailbox, and then we want everybody to be checking their mailboxes. In fact, we want you to check your mailbox today. Please, go to your mailbox today. When people come in late, tell them to go to their mailbox today. <laughs> now, you're going to think there's an echo in here, because I'm going to talk about November Fest. I think Bill just did that, didn't he? Okay, here's the echo. Your knitting and crochet outreach team has been working diligently throughout the year. Now, they need your help. They're looking for your support. And there are several things that you can do. And as Bill said, it is Saturday, November 9th, 8 to 3, 8.30 to 3. Now, the things that you can do are this. First, pray. Pray for a big attendance. Uh, we're trying to get the message out uh, in various ways throughout the community. But pray that people see those messages and they come out and, and uh, take advantage of what we have uh, to show them. Secondly, 
you come. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring a relative, bring somebody. And when you come, you can buy something. In fact, buy lots, lots of stuff. Uh, do some Christmas shopping. The third thing you can do is you can be a vendor. If you make stuff, if you want to sell stuff, you can have a table for yourself. There's no fee for MBC friends and members, no fee. So uh, talk to Mary Beth, tell her you want to be a vendor. We'll get you a table, we'll set you up. Then there's another thing. Part of November Fest is a bake sale. You can bake something and, and turn it in. Let Mary Beth know if uh, you would like to bake something and uh, contribute it uh, for the bake sale. Now, last year, November Fest, the outreach team was able to give $1,000 uh, of the proceeds to the youth ministry. This year, they've dedicated uh, the proceeds to the food bank. So uh, we want this to be a wonderful success to benefit those who are in need. Uh, again, check your mailboxes. You're going to be seeing uh, posters like this. It's been uh, on the screen behind me from time to time. So check that out. At this time, uh, in spite of the fact of what he's wearing, you're going to have to excuse him. Uh, I have uh, practiced forgiveness this morning. Uh, Kenny and Nikki Weisenfelder uh, have a, a, a short message for you as well. Don't look at him. <laughs> Where's that Oreo shirt? Yes, excuse him, because even I won't wear those colors. <laughs> um, we just want to say a few words to appreciate our pastors and how much they have done for us in only a short amount of time. Um, they have been there for us in our darkest and lowest times more than I can count. They have been more than friends. They have been family. They have been mentors. I can't even put into words what they have done for us. So... For Pastor Appreciation Month, please, please, please put together something, even if it's cookies or whatever that you can do for them, just to show them how much they mean to us, because I know how much they mean to me and Kenny. As, as she said, they have they've done a lot for us in our time of need, and my favorite thing uh, Pastor Jeff said these people are taking a new members class and they haven't even moved here yet? What's going on? <laughs> I'll, I'll, never I'll never forget that and I'll never forget how good this church has been to us in our hour of need and I'm trying so hard not to cry right now. <laughs> but um, it, you've all been great and a great family to us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good morning. Again. Okay, go ahead and stand up and greet one another this morning. Or just wave, you know, it works. <laughs> Hi, Ben.
you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Amen. Thank you. This week, as we have Lord's Supper, and we're also, as we do every week, we pray for one of the people groups that are unreached in our world. And uh, this week, and, I, and I'm doing this in conjunction with Lord's Supper because I want you to think about something. Someone at some point, if you've placed your faith in Christ, somebody shared with you the incredible hope of Jesus. And not everybody on our planet has that opportunity. And that's why we pray, that's why we give towards missions, and that's why God may have some of you go. I'm looking forward to the day that somebody's going to be like, I'm headed to wherever, because this is where God's sending me, and um, it's going to be awesome. But today we're looking at the Malanese people of India. They're a Hindu people group living in the hills of northern India. The Bible is not available in their language. Now, I don't know about you, but I probably have more Bibles than I can count. Anybody else have like a Bible in every room? And if you have a, if you have a smartphone, tablet, computer, you have like every possible translation, as we discovered last night around the campfire, of the Bible that you can possibly have. It's amazing. The resources that are out there, and they don't have that. They, don't, they can't open up the Bible and read it in their language. Instead of the Creator God, the Malanese worship idols. Now listen to this next part, guys. I want you to think about this. That they carve from stone, wood, clay, or even dung manure. They're so desperately searching for someone, something to worship, and they're looking in all the wrong places. They're all looking at things that have been made by the Creator. They seek this help and this hope, but these idols can't hear, these idols can't help, these idols can't love, these idols can do nothing. They are accessible, but at the time of this printing, they know of no one who is actively sharing the gospel with them. Think about that. A people group, they don't have the Bible in their language. You can go to them. No one is there sharing the gospel with them. So today we pray for the Malanese people. You have the Bible. Every device. In fact, I'm going to be reading from my phone because my Bible is on my phone. We carry it everywhere we go. And we, I think we kind of get kind of, it's like, we take it for granted because when's the last time you shared with someone about the incredible hope in Jesus? The Malanese people are searching. By the way, your culture is searching too. They may not say that they have an idol of, of wood or, or stone or dung, but there's a lot of people who have an idol that they, they set up and they worship, especially on weekends. Saturdays and Sundays, there's a lot of idol worship that goes on. Sports can become an idol, and I don't, just not picking on, on Kenny, though we do need to pray for that because he needs a better shirt. <laughs> but anything that we put ahead of God is an idol in our life. It can be your family. You should love your family. You better love your family. You say, I, I love my job. That's great. I'm glad that you love what you do. But if your job takes the, in, is in front of God, it has become an idol in your life, and it's wrong. And so when we think about these people, it's so easy for us to be like, all oh, those Melanese people, they're just worshiping everything. They're even worshiping something made out of dung. Do you realize we worship teams that we have no control over, that we have no relationship with? We will wear their shirt. We will cheer. We will be loud. And that's about as, and it's like, why don't we worship God that way? This morning as we come before the Lord's Supper, I'm going to ask the guys, go ahead and come on down and have a seat. This morning, maybe as we read this passage of Scripture that's pretty well known, maybe this morning you need to be like, God, there's some things that I've put as an idol in my life. 
And I need to put you on the throne of my life, that the place that you so deserve. Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night that Jesus, when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This just taking the Lord's Supper or communion is not just something that we do just out of tradition or out of it's the beginning of the month, so we do it. We do it to remember. We do it to stop and to pause and to say, what is it that God has done for me? Because am I the only one? Sometimes in the craziness and the busyness of life, things can get a little blurry, can't they? And so we take this moment and we stop. And yes, it means that we adjust the service. And yes, it means that we'll probably go a few minutes over. It's okay. Because we're stopping to reflect on what Jesus has done for us. That he hung on the cross. He bled. His body was beaten and mangled for you. He was buried. But praise God, after three days, he didn't stay dead. The grave couldn't hold him. And he was raised back to life and he is alive forevermore. And so today we stop to remember what Jesus has done for us. But we also stop to reflect on our own lives. What's going on in our lives. Are there some things that aren't quite right? Are there some things, some sins that we need to confess? Is there some relationships that we need to seek restoration? Paul reminds the the Corinthian church to examine yourselves before you partake. My mama is here today. They surprised me. Mom and dad surprised me and came. If I showed up at the dinner table when I was a kid and my, my hands were covered with everything from the farm, She's not going to let me sit down. She's going to let go get cleaned up. And when Paul says to the Corinthian church to examine yourselves before you partake, he's saying go get cleaned up. Go to the Father and confess whatever it is that you need to confess to come before the partaking of the Lord's Supper, representing his body and his blood, that remembrance to do it with clean hands and a pure heart. And so we're going to take a moment in just the silence of the room for you to take some time to talk to God. And then after we have a moment where we're, we're communicating with God, we're going to take some time and we're going to together participate in the Lord's Supper together, remembering what he has done for us, that he, his body was broken for us, that his blood was shed for us. And if you have placed your faith in Christ and Christ alone, that means there was a time that you recognized that I was a sinner, that I can do nothing on my own to earn my salvation, to get my salvation, to make myself right with God. But there is a Savior. His name is Jesus. He bled and died on the cross and he rose again for me. And I put my trust in him and him alone for the forgiveness of my sins, for the hope of eternal life. If you've done that, then this is the time for you. You don't have to be a member of Memorial. You just got to be a member of God's family. And if this morning, if that's you, we invite you to participate. If there's some things going on that you say, I just can't take today, don't take. And I know people say, well, what is everybody else going to think? Here's the deal. I don't care what anybody else thinks. We need to care about what he thinks. That's where we need to be. So let's take a moment and examine ourselves together. Father, we thank you that you are willing to send your son to die on the cross for us. Father, many in this room can remember back to that moment when their life was forever changed by the gospel. And Father, while we rejoice in that, may our hearts continue to break for the Malinese people who are worshiping things that cannot save. Who are trying to find help, hope, fulfillment 
and truly what can't do anything for them. Father, I pray that you would send somebody to these sweet people. That they would be open to the gospel. That you would send someone who could translate the Bible into their language. That they could read. That they could learn about the incredible God who loved them. Who created them. Who sent his son for them. Who can forgive them of their sin. Father, may we not take our salvation for granted. May we not place any idols in our lives. And God, if we have, may we remove them today. Father, it's such a privilege to be able to stop and remember and to celebrate what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You peel back the first layer, the bread. I would encourage you this week to read through the passage on the crucifixion of Jesus. The language is, it doesn't give you the full gr glimpse of really what happened to Jesus. But when you're beaten like he was beaten, and some historians say that there wasn't an inch of his body that wasn't ripped to shreds. You say, why did he do that? Because he loved you. What an incredible love for sinners who could do nothing on their own. Let's eat of the bread in remembrance of him. As you peel back the foil layer, the cup reminds us of his blood. Hebrews reminds us, and as you read through the Old Testament, you notice in the sacrificial system, blood, blood being shed was necessary 
for the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus' blood was poured out on that cross for you so that you could be forgiven. Let's drink of the cup in remembrance of him. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I'm always, I always tell you about the promise that's in that passage that we just read in 1 Corinthians 11. Until he comes. He's coming. Today's one day closer than yesterday. I don't know when it's going to be, but he's coming. I'm excited. I don't know about you guys. That's right. We should be excited about going home, shouldn't we? It may be today. I'd be okay with that, but... If it's not today, we still press on doing what he's called us to do. That's what we do. Let's stand as we pray and as the band comes back up on stage. Father, thank you for what you have done for us in the sending of your son. Father, as we wait for you to return, may we wait with eager anticipation, but also may we work doing what you have called us to do God, maybe you're calling somebody in this, in this body to go to one of the far corners of the earth, maybe even to the Malinese people, to reach them with the gospel of Jesus. Father, may we not take our salvation for granted. May we not take our freedom of worship for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.
pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship, to praise, Father, to glorify you. Lord, we ask that you help us to never take this opportunity for granted, uh, the privilege it is to worship publicly, uh, corporately, together. God, we thank you for, for the preservation um, of the lives that you preserved uh, in the hurricanes down south. God, we ask that you be with the people still in distress, still in hardship. You be with the crews working to rescue, um, to restore power, to restore access, to give food and aid. Lord, be with them uh, in their time. Be with the people who are there to serve and to spread the gospel. Lord, give them the words to say and the timing to say them. Father, we ask that for the rest of today, be with us. Lord, we ask that your spirit touch our hearts. Uh, Lord, help all that we say and do to honor and glorify you. In your name, amen. Please be seated. Uh, enjoy some, some special music from the Sowers family. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break.
His church is there. Amen. 
This morning we begin a very interesting series on the Holy Spirit. And I said, that, I told our deacons and elders, I said, it's a three-week series. And they looked at me and one of them said, ain't no way you're going to do that, Joe. <laughs> I appreciate your vote of confidence. Um, but we're going to, we're going to, there's no way in three weeks we can fully, fully teach everything there is to know from Scripture about the Holy Spirit. So here's what we're going to do. I'm basically going to give you a teaser for three weeks. Be students of the Word. You've got the same Bible I do. Let's get in it. Be searching. Be studying. There's so many incredible Bible study tools that are available out there. And so I'm going to encourage you because I know when we talk about the Holy Spirit that every time we teach about the Holy Spirit, there's always questions. I expect it. There's always things like, but I thought this. I, I expect it. And, and when we get into teaching about the Holy Spirit, there's a couple of things that, um, that always seem to come into play. There's some people who be like, Jeff, you're too conservative. Then there's some who will say, Jeff, you're not conservative enough. There will be some, which is hilarious, that will say, Jeff, you're way too charismatic. Then there'll be some who say, Jeff, you're not charismatic enough. So I'm not going to please everybody. I get that. But I'm going to seek to teach God's word, to teach it clearly, to teach it accurately, and to teach it what it says. We're going to move away from sometimes the, the self-imposed human traditions that we, we put into who the Holy Spirit is. And, um, and I encourage you, turn to Acts chapter 2. Um, if you're not in the habit of bringing your Bible to church, bring your Bible to church. All right? If you have an electronic Bible, we're having Wi-Fi issues, so if your Bible's not working, that's a problem in life, for sure. Um, so always have a backup paper copy um, that's not dependent on Wi-Fi. Um, but we want to be in Acts chapter 2. We're going to actually dig through a lot of this. We're going to read a huge chunk of Scripture this morning. I debated this back and forth, and I came to the conclusion of this. Nothing I say is really that important. It's what God has already spoken, so we're going to read His Word. And so we're going to go through this passage, and as we get to Acts chapter 2, it's very interesting because this chapter, you see the beginning of the church with the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, and, and some have called this time period the age of the Spirit. John MacArthur says this is a turning point in history for God's kingdom because you see things happening that you kind of didn't see happen before. And if you've ever read the book of Acts, you know it gets a little exciting, right? And there's things you're like, okay, that's what they're doing. Should we do that or do we not do that or what's going on? I want to encourage you, be here the next three weeks. Today we're basically getting started as to who the Holy Spirit is. Next week we're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, it's going to be good. The week after that, the gifts of the Spirit, which is where a lot of times it's like, I don't know. Let me just explain this too. I just want to throw this out there, okay? We can have a difference of opinion and still get along and still worship together. The conclusion of the matter is this. We believe there is one God, there is one Savior, Jesus Christ, who has sent His Holy Spirit, and you'll see how all that plays out in the life of a believer. There's one Bible, God's Holy Word. The gospel cannot be changed, altered. If it's, if it's Jesus plus anything else, that you've polluted and diluted the gospel. We're going to agree on the, on the main chunks of what is so important. I know people that they belong to different denominations. They have some really different ideas. But together we can actually still have incredible conversations and still celebrate our hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Now, are there some doctrines and some things that are going to cause us to be like, hey, that ain't going to happen? Absolutely. If you say Jesus is just a man, we're going to have some problems. If you're going to say, I can work my way to heaven, we're going to have some problems. Why? Because that's not what God's Word teaches. That's what we always go back to. And so when we, when we, do, when we study this out together, there's going to be some things that you may say, but i got a question about this, and I'm gonna, probably the first question I'm going to ask you is, have you studied it out? Have you studied it out? Dig into God's Word. What is it teaching? What is it saying? What are you learning? So we're going to pray, and then we're going to make sure in Acts chapter 2, we're going to read through about the first 41 verses. But as we pray and uh, give this time completely to God, I want to just lift up a request. Um, and want you guys to be praying. Aaron Ketron's niece, Sarah, is in vaca on vacation in California, is in the hospital with a temperature of 104. And so we're going to, as we pray this morning, as we start our service, we're going to be praying for Sarah as well, praying that God would heal. 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for just the time of being able to to be together as a body and to worship you through song, to worship you through, through serving you. Father, this morning, we ask for your wisdom. Book of James makes it pretty clear. If any of us lack wisdom, he should ask of God because God gives generously. And we pray that you would this morning. Father, we also pray for Sarah this morning. And God, we pray that as she is facing what she doesn't know what's going on and why the temperature is as high as it is, I pray that right now that you would touch her and heal her. That you would remove this fever. That you would remove anything that is going on that's causing it. But God, if you choose not to do that, I pray that whether it's removed and whether she's healed quickly or whether it takes some time, I pray that you be glorified. I pray that the focus be on you and people can see Jesus through what's going on. Father, help us as we open your word this morning. God, you're so good. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for preserving it, for protecting it. God, thank you for being so good to us, messed up sinners. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared on to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at, at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native tongue? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, saying they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall, shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that he will not set one of his descendants on that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This, <coughs> excuse me, this Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses. 
being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Man, there's a lot in there. Isn't that exciting? Whew. Let's break it down a little bit. We're obviously not going to go through every verse. You're probably th thinking, wow, this is good. Number one, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, here's where it gets really interesting, because if I were to ask this question, we'd probably get a pause and like, well, um, um, but if I were to ask, who is Jesus? We'd be like, oh, I'll tell you all about Jesus. If I were to say, who is God the Father? You'd be like, oh, let me tell you about God the Father. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we're kind of a little bit like, ah, we don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. And um, I have a theory. This is my own personal theory. This doesn't come from anything, so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I have this theory because when you, when you think about it and you look at church history, in the 1960s, there was a movement that began. In the 1960s, those movements started to creep into churches called the Charismatic Movement. And I, I'm convinced of what's happened is in, in theologically conservative churches, which is what we would be, it, they were like, we don't want to be identified. And so we pull the pendulum way back one way to not be identified with something that we may like, we're not sure what to do with it. And so what we did is we stopped teaching about the Holy Spirit. We stopped talking about the Holy Spirit. We stopped learning about the Holy Spirit. And we just said, we don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. And so what's happened is we've become Holy Spirit illiterate people. That's my own personal theory. If I'm wrong, you can tell me after church, all right? But one of the problems is, is we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. We don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. And then when we do hear something and somebody says, man, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit really moved in my life, we're like, I don't know what to do with that. Is it, is it right? Is it wrong? Is it legit? Is, why am I not feeling this? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm really glad you asked that question. All right. The Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit is God. He is a member of the Trinity or the triunity. While he is a member of the Trinity and he is God, he is, he is independent from the Son and the Father. Okay? The Holy Spirit is not like the power of God the Father. Okay? They're each separate in their entities. He is God. He is eternal. Even though we really only see glimpses of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and we really see him in Acts, he existed from eternity. Always has been because guess what? The Holy Spirit is God. And God has always? And he always? You guys are awesome. Way to go. All right. Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not a thing or an it. Do not refer to the Holy Spirit as an it or a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. Refer to him as he. Okay? So keep that in mind because when we downplay it and be like, well, the Holy Spirit, it, it's like we've kind of suddenly just kind of reduced who he is. Good luck with that one, by the way. Um, the Holy Spirit, remember, he's not the force. He's not, it's not some Star Wars thing of like, okay, if I have my Bible and I hold my Bible right, I can just be like, you know, Luke Skywalker and use the force. I can use the Holy Spirit. Not quite the case. We need some more Star Wars fans in this church. All right. One of the things that you're going to see today is this. The Holy Spirit is a necessary part of the believer's life. If we did not have the Holy Spirit, we would be in some massive trouble this morning, as you're going to see, as we see how he works in our lives. Second thing, the Holy Spirit provides the power to do what we alone cannot do. The Holy Spirit provides the power to do what we alone cannot do. Now, as you look at the first 11 verses of, of Acts chapter 2, you see the Holy Spirit doing some things that's absolutely amazing. 
We see that the setting is Pentecost. And by the way, there was a, probably about 200,000 people in Jerusalem for Pentecost. That's quite the crowd. So when all these different people from all over and they're saying, hey, we're hearing something in our own language, this is not like everybody that's just in the town and got together and be like, oh, of course we understand them. No, there were 200,000 people around. It says that they were all together. The believers were together. And then this is awesome because this is how God works. It says, suddenly... It was nothing based on, you know, these believers did something just right so that the Holy Spirit said, okay, you're set, you've set it up just right, now we're good to go. No, it was not dependent upon man, but suddenly the Holy Spirit comes, and this is really great because it says it's from heaven. Who's in heaven? Gives you an idea of the source. This is important. And then it says that there is a sound. Now, one of the things that we always get wrong is we say, man, the, there was a great big wind and tongues of fire. Read the text. It's very important to read the text. What does it say? As you look at the mighty wind, it says, like a mighty rushing wind. Okay? Here's the, here's the reality of it. When it comes to describing what God can do and what the Holy Spirit can do, there are some things that we just can't put human words to because our human words are a little bit ina inadequate. Like we say, God is mighty. I might say, Richard is mighty. There's a big difference between Richard and God. Because his might knows no end. But it was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. As Charles Ryrie says, it wasn't wind, but the roar or re reverberation that fills the place. The greatest thing, I, the, the closest thing I can kind of get an idea of what this is, is when your son has a drum set in the basement and is playing it full, full volume. Your feet get a massage, but there's this roar that's just filling the room, that's filling the space. Now keep this in mind, because then what does it say next? There's this sound, but then there's a sight, divided tongues as a fire. Once again, not literal fire. But these are beyond human comprehension. These are the best terms that man could describe them. Now here's where it gets really interesting because it gets to verse 4. And suddenly we're like, we don't know what to do as good little Baptists. Because verse 4, and all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. What is going on? This is a little crazy. We're like, what, what is happening here? Because here's the deal. America has so abused what is truly happening here. And in three weeks as we get into the gifts of the Spirit, we're going to hit briefly on the gifts of tongue because it's the one everybody's like, tell me about more about that. Okay, we're going to find out what it actually is and what is going on. And I can tell you this, the majority of things, actually, I'll just go say this. Um, it, it, tongues that are spoken in churches, most times they're just, no. Because as we're going to look and see what's going on here, we see that the tongues that they're speaking in, they're actually a known language. That's why this whole group of people can understand what's being said, because it's in their own language. Now, we could have a lot of fun if we had the time, because we've got many languages actually that are able to be spoken in this church, which is sweet. All right? Now, all right. Who here ha has no clue of German? That, like, you don't know a single German word. All right. Now, if my wife just starts jabbering in German, which I'm thankful she doesn't do to me because I know about four words and they always usually get me in trouble. Because um, calling her a dummy usually doesn't help an argument at all. Um, but think about that. That's what's going on. Becky's a German speaker. Think about it, she didn't know English. And suddenly she's able to hear what's being spoken by someone in German. And they didn't know German before. This is where it gets really incredible. And this is why the Holy Spirit provides the power to do what we can't do on our own. Because as you see what's going on here, you see the surprise. Because they're like, wait a minute, these are all Galileans. They don't speak like us. They're not from our hometown. They, don't, they, they shouldn't be able to speak the language that we're speaking, and yet we see that they do. Now, one of the things that really gets fun as we look at verse 4, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we start to squirm as Baptists in our pews because we don't know what to do with this. 
Because we're like, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Am I filled with the Spirit? Should I be filled with the Spirit? What does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? I'm so glad you asked. So glad you asked. I'm so glad for the confused looks on your faces because you need to know this. One of the, there's some terms that we need to understand that are very, very important to understanding the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives today. First thing we're going to look at is the baptism of the Spirit. Now, if you get into 1 Corinthians 12, it says, For just as, as the body is one and many members, and all the members of the body, though, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. So we're baptized in the Spirit. What does that even mean? How are we baptized in the Spirit? Luke, come on up. Luke has volunteered to be my, uh, my prop for the day. He'll probably never come home from college again. Um, but when we think about baptism, if you remember, we actually, we practice believer's baptism, which is what? The word baptize comes from baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. Okay? So something that is baptized is placed into. Okay? Now, baptism of the Spirit. This is a one-time event that happens when a person places their faith in Christ. So, Luke was, a, was just a horrible sinner because that's where we all start off. You may be cute and wrinkly, but you're a sinner. All right? Luke was a sinner, but he recognized his sin. He realized, I'm a horrible, filthy, rotten sinner headed to hell. And he says, I need help. So he looks in the right place. He looks to Jesus, and he realizes that God loved him, that God sent his son to die on the cross, and that forgiveness is possible through Christ and Christ alone. So Luke, and by the way, there is no, no uh, like the, the, the little prayer that you've got to say the exact words. There's no such thing as that in Scripture anywhere, okay? And, uh, there's, and so Luke pours out his heart to God, and he says, God, I'm a sinner I've tried, to, I've tried to make myself right with you. I can't do it, but I know that you love me. You created me. You have sent your son, and he gave his life to Jesus, and Luke gets the forgiveness of sin. So here's what happens. This is where it gets cool. So Luke is a sinner, okay? This tote represents the body of Christ, okay? So Luke, as a sinner who has no way capable on his own to get into the body of Christ, so what happens is he is baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. He is now in the body of Christ, okay? He is a believer. Now, here's where it gets even better, because that's not, the, uh, not all of it. Because also, the Holy Spirit is, seals him, and you're thinking, what in the world? This is a mark of identification. He is in the body of Christ. His label, the Holy Spirit places his seal on him. Now, what does that mean? This is where it gets really great. This is identifying who he is. John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the moment that Luke places his faith in Christ, he is placed into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit puts his seal on him, which is also recognized by Luke being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. How does this work? He's God. This is why as a follower of Jesus, when you're thinking about doing something, you know it's wrong, and suddenly it feels like somebody's kicking you in the ribs. It's the Holy Spirit going, shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, live for Jesus. He's in the body of Christ. He's been baptized in the Spirit, one-time event. He's been sealed by the Spirit, one-time event. But then it gets interesting. Because what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Being filled with the Spirit is not the baptism of the, of the Spirit. It's not the sealing of the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is yielding or surrendering control to the Holy Spirit. So here's what this looks like. When you place your faith in Christ, you yield control. Luke is now under my control. He is filled, which means being controlled. He is now being controlled by someone else. Now, here's what's interesting. You can never change your baptism in the Spirit. Can't change it. Once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. 
John 10, 28, 29, you can't get out. If you could get out, then you can undo what God has done. Good luck. There is, you can't undo the sealing of the Spirit. You can't ever remove the Spirit from your life. But you can resist His control. And this is where believers get in trouble because they decide, I'm going to go my own way. Just do your own thing. And they resist what the Spirit, they're no longer functioning under the control of the Spirit. They, you would say that they're no longer filled with the Spirit. They're no longer controlled by the Spirit because they looked at the Spirit and said, we're going to do it our own way because I know better. By the way, what a foolish thing for frail humanity to say to God. I think I know better than you. Now here's where it gets interesting because this is so much fun. How do we get, how do we give? control and surrender to the holy spirit we need to remove sin sin is going to keep us from from having that relationship husbands and wives it's like when you're just not having a good day with your spouse and there's some friction in the air and guys we're not sometimes the smartest we're like hey honey how's it going and she's like go outside there's something going on there, and when we have sin in our lives, it's going to affect that relationship. It's going to affect the control of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but it gets even better. We confess sin. We get into God's Word. If you want to know how to live a Spirit-filled life, a Spirit-controlled life, read the manual. Read the manual. Read what it says. It's like, I don't know what God wants me to do. Have you not read? It's there. Read it. He says, love your neighbor. Start there. You're like, but you don't know my neighbor. Yeah, but God knows you. All right? Get in God's word. Read it. Study it. Know it. Then this is where it gets so good. Ben, come on up here. I need you too, buddy. Um, he has no clue what's going on, so this is even better. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. I want you to listen to this verse. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for God. Come over here, Ben. Isn't it interesting that the parallel example that is used is what alcohol does when you drink too much? You lose control, and it leads to stupidity. Can we get an amen on that? All right. What is being the example here says, as you drink, it's going to lead to things that you're going to sober up and regret. And that, that control that you're giving to the alcohol says, that is what you need to be giving to the Spirit, giving Him control. Hop in the bucket too, Ben. Ben has placed his faith in Christ. All right. Now, here's what's interesting. I want you to, I want you to, to look at something. Stare at them. This is good. They've both placed their faith in Christ. They've both been sealed by the Spirit. They're both seeking to be filled or controlled by the Spirit. Do you know what the result of that is? Church, you've got to get this, because I think this is our problem. It says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here's the deal, church. Of all people on this planet that should be able to figure out problems and should be able to figure out how do we live together, it should be us. Why is it we have church issues and church problems? You know why that is? It's because somebody said, you know what? My own way is better, and I don't want to be controlled. Amen. There needs to be a spirit of unity. Do we always agree? No. It's okay. Because we're majoring on the majors, and we've got unity because we're like, we are brothers in Christ. We are sisters in Christ. You know what? We are supposed to be representing what the world needs. And so what are we doing? We're singing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're joining the band together. A band that is not together is not a good band. You're like, man, they got issues, and they're not on the same page, not on the same music. They're together. They're working together. But I love this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's kind of like two guys at a door going, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. 
Why? Because all they want to do is serve one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the Spirit being filled with the Spirit in action in God's church. This is what it looks like. We all realize we're in the same boat, and we're rowing along together. Together. And when there's somebody whose oar is not quite working right, you don't throw them overboard. You come alongside and go, hey, can I, can I help you learn how you can be controlled and filled by the Spirit and do what He wants you to do? You're not supposed to take it completely off there, buddy. But as a church, as followers of Jesus, this is what we need to be doing. This is God's church. The question is this. You guys can have a seat. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. The question is this. Are you in Christ? I never assume that just because you're sitting on a church pew that you've given your life to Christ. I never assume that. I've told way too many stories. We've seen stories in our church. So we're never going to assume. Has there been a time when you've placed your faith in Christ, realizing that apart from Him, there was no hope, there was no help, there was no forgiveness, there was nothing? You were, you were damned to hell because of your sin, and that there's nothing you could do about it. But when the grace and loving kindness of our Lord appeared, that moment you realized, He's my hope. He's my help. And he put you into the body of Christ. He placed his seal upon you. The question is this. Number one, are you in Christ? Number two, who's holding the rope? Who's holding the rope? As Americans, we're people that like our own control. We like people, don't you tell me what to do. How do I know that? Because I'm just like you. You give me a rule, I look, I'm like, I don't like it. I'm a rebel at heart that's been redeemed. And I got to give up my control and let him be the one who is in control. Very quickly. Number three, the Holy Spirit's activity is consistent with that of the Father and of the Son. Look at verse 11, the very end of it. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. It's always about him. If it's about us, we've missed the point. It's always about the mighty works of God. The Holy Spirit empowering believers is never about the person's self-exaltation. It's always gospel advancing, propelling men towards the finished work of Jesus. Fourth, we see the response to the work of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the same as everything else. Anytime you share the gospel, there's always going to be an interesting response, and it's not always the same. Look at verses 12 and 13. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, saying they're filled with new wine. Now, it's very interesting because Peter addresses that part where they're like, man, these guys, they're all drunk. That's why they're doing what they're doing. One question, you ever seen a drunk man speak coherently? Yet in another language that he previously did not know. I don't know what he's drinking. But it's also, Peter says, hey, it's only only the third hour. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. And what is Peter saying is, even the people who drink a lot, they're, they're they're not plastered at 9 in the morning. And so what is going on here? You have some who are amazed, and you have some who say it's alcohol fueled. There's always going to be those who are curious, and there's always going to be those who criticize what what the Spirit of God does. Always. Number five, the results of the Holy Spirit's work. I love this. If you look at verses 37 down through 41, these people that hear Peter's sermon, They've been called by God. They repent of their sins. They're baptized in the Spirit. They're sealed by His Spirit. Then they're baptized in water as a public identification of their new life in Christ. 3,000 people that day, their lives are forever changed. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit isn't powerful. 
Look at what he did. The question is, is what's our response? What's our response? This happens individually. This also happens as a church. Because so many times, this is what we do. We're like, I am going to do what God wants me to do. And we're like, we've got this. And we're going to do it on our own strength. We've got this. This is going to be. And we wonder why our efforts seem to be a little difficult. Here's the deal. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, he's powerful. He has the power, and he can make things go so much easier. I apologize, Larry, for messing this up. So many times, people, this is what we do. We try to do what God wants us to do, but we try to do it on our own power. And we wonder why it's such a struggle. We wonder why it's like, this is just exhausting, and it's just miserable, and it's horrible. And it's like beating my head against a block wall. Why is that? Because you're trying to do it on your own. As a follower of Jesus, that you're not, that's not how you're supposed to live. You need him. You need the Holy Spirit's power in your life. How do you fight sin? I'm going to fight it on my own. Have fun with that. You need his help. You need his power. You need his protection. Don't try to do it on your own. And maybe it could be, as we get into the next two weeks, especially next week, we think we know the fruit of the Spirit. I don't think we know the fruit of the Spirit. I don't think we know what that looks like. Because I think a lot of times we try to do the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, in the power of ourself, but not in the Holy Spirit's power. Here's the deal. Where you at? Do you know Christ? You place your faith in Him. Have you given Him control? Every day we have to wake up and say this. I'm secure in Christ. I know I've been baptized in the Spirit because I place my faith in Christ. He's put His seal upon me. He's indwelt me. I'm in Him. That can't be changed by me or anybody else, but am I going to let him have control today? And every day, sometimes maybe even multiple times throughout the day, we got to stop and say, who's really got control? Who's really got control? Who is it that's really leading? Is it me? Am I doing my own thing? Or am I letting God's spirit be the one who is in control, who's leading and directing my life. Where are you at this morning? And is there a change that you need to make? You say, there is. Well, you've come to the right place. Because we want to help you. Whether that's praying for you, praying with you, walking with you through your struggle. Maybe this morning you say, Jeff, I don't know Jesus. You talk about being in Christ and forgiven and free. And that's a wish because I don't have that. I'm uneasy and I'm restless and I just feel really unforgiven and feel really miserable in my sin. There's a cure and his name is Jesus. Today could be the greatest day of your life. You give your life to him. Accept his free gift called salvation. That you can't earn you can't work towards. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. He sent his son so that this could be for you. That you could be made new. Father, you know every heart. You know every person in this room. The things that they may be struggling with. The areas where they know that they're not giving you control of Father, we try to put our nice little happy church faces on, but God, may we just be real with you. May we be real with each other. God, maybe someone sitting here this morning says, I need Jesus. I need that forgiveness so desperately in my life. God, as we close, I pray that you would be with those who say, I need some help. I need some prayer. I need some Jesus. 
that you would give them the courage to, to ask and say, Jeff, can you pray with me? Can you help me? God, your son was willing to hang naked on a cross for us. Why are we so ashamed? Why are we so afraid? Help us be bold to do what you've called us to do and to give you control. May we be filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. something from what Pastor Jeff has given to us about the Holy Spirit and our fellowship together. I'm one of the deacons, Brian Woolsey, and we are here to serve you. In the bulletin, you'll find each one of the deacons, and if you choose to have further help or advice or, you know, just a fellow, to, someone to be there with you, call. Happy to have you here. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with an understanding of how strong we are through the Holy Spirit in unity together. I pray that you'll continue to guide us through this week. 
Give us your love. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.